Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Arvind Taka. I'm a liver and pancreatic surgeon. I work in Southampton. Um, I'm unfortunately am going to sort of trouble you with some more, uh, and I will show you some slides. You can look away. Right um, what I'm going to talk to you about is is liver direct therapies, and uh, most of that is in fact the work of the radiology team, uh, and we play quite a significant part uh, along with Christian. Uh, in Southampton in sort of enabling all that treatment. I will preface by saying that I will come across as being extremely enthusiastic and a convert to quite a few of the therapies that I'm going to talk about. But the fact is, as you would have heard from your oncologists and, and your local teams, you've got a rare disease and hence randomized control trials, the so-called gold standard of evidence in medicine isn't quite available to you. And hence, as Kristen was saying about 10 minutes ago, it's very easy to become extremely passionate about one particular modality or the other. I think what I'm going to try and emphasize is that there are options available. We've seen some very good results with pretty much all of them. I'm obviously going to talk to you about the really good results we've had, but also, but the fact is, at the other end of that spectrum, there are, there are patients that haven't responded and haven't done so well. But I hope by the end of it, the concept that uh, I'm hoping to plug, this uh, uh, essentially a concept of what we call is multimodal treatment. So not just one silver bullet, because unfortunately, I'm sad to say it, there isn't one. And there isn't one for any cancer, really. And we're becoming increasingly convinced by that cancer is a multimodal, intelligent being with lots of reasons why it spreads and forms, but also that its treatment there isn't a silver magic bullet that's going to sort it out. And the concept that actually we might not be able to offer you a cure that can possibly have a control on your disease for a significant amount of time. And that's something quite different to what we're saying now, to what we were saying 10 years ago, because that concept is extremely difficult, especially for patients to understand in terms of so you can't cure me? No, but I can probably keep you alive for a lot longer than what the books are saying. So it is a different concept to sort of have a think about, really. Uh, so I'm going to start off by uh, showing you my title slide, um, which um, is of a liver that's been affected with ocular melanoma. <coughs> if it works. Not showing up uh, for some reason, guys. Slideshow. Can you see that now? Yep. Okay. Right. Uh, so I'm sorry about your coffee and the cake. Um, that is a liver that's been affected with ocular melanoma. And that is a liver that's got what we call is is Millery disease, so small dots of ocular melanoma across the entire disease, uh, across the entire, you know, sort of liver. Uh, and in the old days, people would say that that's bad news. But actually, I'm hoping to tell you that it isn't as bad news as you think it is, or at least that's what we are starting to think. Um, I have got a few things uh, to say. I don't have any financial interest in the treatments that I'm going to be talking to you about. Uh, we have been supported with some grants by a couple of the companies uh, that, uh, that do offer these treatments in Southampton, uh, but uh, I don't have any shares or financial interest in them. Uh, very briefly, uh, uh, I think you know this more than I do. So my background is that I'm, I've trained in liver transplantation and liver cancer surgery. And I actually, uh, in fact, I'm, I wouldn't be here if it, if it wasn't for one man, a chap that a lot of you might know, this guy called Neil Pearce who is a consultant surgeon down in Southampton, unfortunately is not well and doesn't operate anymore. But uh, I was going to be a transplant surgeon in Birmingham. I came down to Southampton because I'd heard about Neil and the techniques he was using to sort of operate on the liver. And I essentially never went back. Uh, and part of that reason is because I was very convinced by his approach to certain diseases in the liver, which is different from what is doctrine. But actually, we think that it is increasingly becoming a more common approach to cancer in particular. I don't particularly have to talk to you about this bit. Uh, this is uh, the first part of a presentation that I do. But the fact is, um, you know, I started out in medical school being told that ocular melanoma 
is an extremely rare condition. And actually, in my clinics, uh, most weeks, I will have at least one patient who I'm either following up or uh, has been sent to me by, you know, by Christian that we are talking about treatment. So uh, I think if you gravitate to centers that have an interest in these things, the fact is you will continually tr see more and more of these patients. Um, I think you're all familiar with the, with the fact that there is a difference between the disease, although the cells look very much the same. That cutaneous melanoma behaves differently to ocular melanoma. Liver metastatic disease behaves differently. Uh, and again, you know, that I, I suspect this is uh, more for sort of Sachin to talk to you about. But the fact is, as Christian mentioned, the primary treatment doesn't appear to affect the overall survival. And as Sachin said, the fact is, if you get the eye treated, it is incredibly unusual to get recurrence in the eye. Of course you can, but it is unusual. What we find difficult to tackle is the disease, the extraocular spread. And uh, most commonly, for factors that we particularly don't understand, we have a slight clue of why it happens and why the liver is the main organ that is affected. But the fact is, we don't know fully the mechanisms but we also know that there is a high proportion of patients that get metastatic disease, and of those, the most are the ones with, you know, with actual disease in the liver. And prognostication. Again, we've had a question previously that is it worth getting a, bi a biopsy or not? Uh, I think those of us who believe fairly strongly in, in lifelong surveillance would say that the answer is yes. Uh, uh, there certainly is a very good you know, sort of counterpoint saying that do you really want uh, the heartache of being told that you're high risk? Uh, and the question is, I think the main point is it's a personal answer really and it is uh, essentially dependent on each patient. But there are a number of factors that can show you why you would or would not be a high risk patient. And there have been a number of papers published on it and I'm hoping not to spend too much time on this mainly because I will probably blather on quite a lot about techniques and what we do. Um, uh, so, uh, and finally, there, is, there are a number of scores. The Liverpool team are very well known for their sort of uh, a score at, in terms of looking at high or low risk, but I'm just going to straight away come on to treatment, really. Um, the fact is, as a surgeon, you would think that, you know, I spent all my time doing these operations, but the fact is that they're the majority of our patients are actually not candidates for an operation on the liver, mainly for the reasons that you saw that first slide, that if you've got disease, small volume disease across the entire liver, there isn't, I can't take the whole organ away, can't do it. And so we have to rely on a combination of surgery, as well as a couple of things that I'm gonna to talk to you about, which we think have potential in helping our patients. Uh, so only about 15% of patients will actually end up having an operation, and I'll talk to you about why. And then we think that because the disease is mainly confined to the liver, we tend to give a combination of the treatments that I'll talk to you about, and also the fact that currently, as Christian mentioned, the role of systemic treatment, so treatments that you can take as a pill or as a, you know, sort of an injection into a vein, we're not entirely sure about how good they are for long-term prognosis. We think there are some interesting signs, and you might have all heard about the anti-PD-1 drugs, et cetera. Most of that data is in cutaneous melanoma, but the fact is there are some interesting factors there which may or may not be you know, sort of beneficial to us. And the fact that, as mentioned previously, the metastatic disease in quite a lot of individuals appears to progress very fast. I'll show you some slides across a few months. Again, the question of is surveillance helpful or not, but the fact is that in terms of if you scan people with known disease and possibly try and do something about it, frequently you will see that there is progression across a very short interval of time. So just a quick plug for the Southampton team. Uh, uh, as Sachin said, none of this is possible without a team approach, really. And one of the things about liver metastatic disease in Southampton is that we do have a critical mass of an interested surgical team, a very interested and passionate oncological team, and a very skilled radiologist. And we feel that that is a combination that we need to be successful. Uh, the fact is, yes, Christian? Are you saying that we're the thin end of the wedge? I think so. I think we are the thin end of the wedge, absolutely. <laughs> um, we meet every other week. 
we pretty much meet outside our sort of allocated time. Uh, we're hoping to get funding uh, to actually have it built into our job plans. But the fact is, uh, we've uh, sort of, you know, essentially when I joined, uh, both Neil and Christine were running the service literally um, off their own backs. And the fact is, we're pretty much still doing it, but it is slowly becoming formalized. So the fact is, we are at the moment individually tracking our patients as sort of, you know, as consultants. We discuss all our patients down in the MDT with Brian Stedman, who is you'll all, or most of you would have heard of. Uh, and the fact is, we come up with a consensus decision whether a patient is, uh, you know, uh, is a good candidate for an operation, for TACE, Delcath, which I think is probably one of the things that you'll all want to hear about. But we have very good links with, you know, sort of outside sources. And as Sachin said, the ocular melanoma sort of community in the UK is extremely small, and we all do talk to, you know, sort of each other. Increasingly, since intervention radiology and surgery is becoming quite a major part of what we do, we are getting, you know, sort of referrals from pretty much all over the world. Uh, Zimbabwe, Australia, uh, with, I think we're seeing someone from Turkey in a few days' time. Uh, so the fact is, uh, you know, in a small community of patients, the word is getting out, and there are, there are patients coming to see us from pretty much all over. But you can't do this without a team effort. There's just absolutely no way of uh, sort of explaining this to you. And, and again, I would say to you, if there are sort of individuals who are telling you that they are the sole authority in treatment, I would say to you that, that, that you need to have a think about going to them. Because the fact is, a team approach is what works best, in my view. Um, so what local regional therapy? So I'm going to talk to you a bit about sort of operating on the liver. I'm going to talk to you a bit about TACE, which is transarterial chemoembolization, and uh, and its sort of god you know so, well sort of goddaughter, which is Debiri TACE. Uh, we don't particularly use photomastine treatment, but we do use uh, Delcath treatment, which is percutaneous hepatic perfusion. I have got some slides on that. I've got a few of our early results with the, with the actual modality. I'm also going to tell you a few controversial things about the fact that it's not funded and we don't entirely know how we are sort of offering it in Southampton, but we are. Uh, and about radioembolization, which is one of the newer treatments that's coming on board, and again, we think uh, has some role uh, in ocular melanoma liver metastases. So just very quickly, um, oh, it's not, not projected as well as I'd like it to, but the fact is you can see a liver lesion. So this is a CT scan. Uh, scans are done just very quickly, although I have to say in my experience with ocular melanoma patients, most of them have seen their own scans a number of times and know what it means. So just very quickly, that's a liver. And the way we look at, C at CT scans is as though your, your sort of body's been cut across that way and we're looking up your body. So that side is your right side, that side is the left side. And the liver is extremely large organ, one of the biggest ones in the body. And if you can see with the projection and the light, there is a tumor just on the right side up there. Now, if you go across, and these are just a few months across, that tumor is now quite large and essentially is inoperable. And we're talking about a six to eight month progression here. The fact is, that's one slide. The disease behaves differently in different individuals. So, uh, you know, the fact is that that is not true for everybody. Uh, the fact is, they can sometimes, you can have quite a large tumor that essentially does nothing for a long time. But you can also have many small tumors that behave in quite an aggressive way in a very short time. So it isn't that this is gold standard, but the fact is the disease does have a propensity to be quite aggressive at times. So what do we believe in? Well, we believe multiple interventions timed sequentially maximize the reduction in tumor volume uh, with, low, with low, you know, lowest risks. Now, I have to preface this with the fact that uh, so we come from a background of treating a number of cancers, including something called neuroendocrine tumors, which is a slow-growing tumor, which again gets diagnosed quite late with multiple metastases, lots of bulky liver disease, nodes everywhere. It does affect the bowel. And again, we use a, what we call as a multimodal approach. So we operate, the chemotherapists give chemotherapy, the radiologists use their, their own techniques to work on parts that they can, you know, that, uh, uh, that they can treat. We think ocular melanoma will benefit and does benefit, at least in our practice, 
from this approach. Again, I will preface this with the fact that I'm not telling you that we have better survival than other places. And there's a very good, you know, good argument, as Christian said, why do anything at all? But the fact is, you're a super selective group. That's why you're here. Uh, we are a super selective group because that's why we are here. And so consequently, I'm going to talk to you about what we think is probably one of the ways for, you know, uh, well, forward in, in the treatment uh, of this condition. So we basically divide it into what can we do locally. So the eye has been operated upon low risk of recurrence. There's, there's metastases in the liver. Can we operate on it? Reason being, there's very good data showing that if there's isolated lumps in the liver and you can take them away completely, there is good evidence to show that you can have the disease under control for a considerable amount of time. I think no one in this room in terms of the, you know, of the clinicians are saying to you that they can cure the, you know, they can cure the disease. I don't think that's, that's possible. But what we are saying to you is that we can have an opportunity to control the disease and hopefully, along with that, give you a very good quality of life. Um, if that doesn't work or we think that isn't appropriate, that's, and by that I mean, you know, I can't operate on the liver, local treatments. So TACE, which we'll briefly talk about, DELCATH, which we'll briefly talk about, and radioembolization, which we'll briefly talk about, and also the actual systemic treatments. Again, the drugs that you take by mouth, by a vein, which hopefully will have some effect in controlling the actual disease. Again, the evidence is patchy. Uh, why do we get involved? Well, it's a liver dominant disease. There's no getting around it. And, uh, 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 and we have found increasingly that, uh, that certainly looking at the actual disease, especially liver isolated disease, uh, we definitely have treatments that we can give. How, uh, how sort of effective or good they are in the longer term, time will tell. We do think uh, that there should be quite a rapid escalation to treatment just because of that slide I showed you. So uh, we do get patients that come to us who say they have been in a, in a different center where they've had an ultrasound scan that has raised the possibility of a metastasis. And uh, the question is, uh, perhaps they should scan again in three months time. Uh, this is not an unusual story in my clinic. Uh, the, well, the answer is that that question should be answered now that the guidelines are being published. But the fact is, we do still have people who come to us and say, well, should I have a CT scan? Should I have an MRI scan? We generally tend to be quite aggressive in terms of what we say uh, that you should have in terms of treatment, you know, what sort of modalities. And, and I certainly, along with Christian, would say that you would, we would advocate a CT scan because if there's isolated disease, we would want to be quite quick in trying to determine what we would do with your liver. Uh, and we, we like to think that we have quite a good turnaround time in terms of once we've decided on treatment as to how quickly we can get on with it. Uh, there's no doubt about that, 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 uh, that you know, so having an MDT that meets every other week uh, is quite, uh, quite, you know, quite uh, helpful in that regard. Liver surgery, well, I could go on for days and days about liver surgery, you know, but the fact is uh, we, we do about 160 to 180 liver operations in Southampton a year. Uh, of those, ocular melanoma will probably constitute, in my practice at least, probably about 5%. So a very small number of patients would actually come to have an operation. But the fact is, if they do, they tend to do very well, because most ocular melanoma patients in general tend to be on the fitter side, tend to be very motivated, and uh, we generally tend to get them out of hospital pretty quickly. Good example, uh, so just a quick plug for what we do. We do quite a lot of our major liver operations, so taking away the right or the left half of the liver uh, laparoscopically, and by that I mean via a keyhole procedure. So the general thinking about taking large chunks of the liver out is that you get a cut that runs from just below your rib cage up across to the right side, so it's a big J-shaped thing. Uh, and the scar does tend to be quite tender. We take lots of, you know, uh, well, uh, sort of precautions to make sure that it isn't as tender as it could be, but functional type recovery does take a while. You know, it is a big operation, there's no doubt about it. Neil Pierce, the chap I mentioned before, is a pioneer in laparoscopic liver surgery, which is the reason I came down to Southampton, and we've got the biggest series in Europe for laparoscopic liver resections. So this is a young lady, ocular melanoma, and I'll come back to her very briefly. But we took 60% of her liver out. It was a 
uh, gram specimen, so about a kilogram of liver, right liver. But we did it with one centimeter scar, one centimeter scar, two centimeter scar, one centimeter scar, and then the same scar that you get for a C-section, a cesarean section, about five centimeters uh, down uh, you know, at the bikini line. She was home within four days, and actually she wanted to go home on day three, and I sort of said to her that I didn't particularly know why I was keeping her in, but I, it, it was just because I hadn't sent anyone home after such a big operation on day three. So, so the fact is that uh, you know, uh, we are getting good functional recovery. Now, why is this important in ocular melanoma? Well, the fact is that that would not be your only treatment. That would be part of quite a number of treatments that you're going to be having. And our feeling is that if we can do the case via keyhole surgery, laparoscopically, then we can get you better, quicker, to go on to your next stage of treatment. Not everybody gets that, and we talk to you about the risk that about 10% you know, of our patients, we have a look inside your sort of tummy and say that we've basically determined that we can't do this case via keyhole. So uh, you know, I do prepare most of my patients for the fact that if they wake up with a big scar, it just means that I couldn't have done it via the keyhole approach. And occasionally, the location of the tumor, where it is, what we want to do at the end of it all is to make sure that we take the lump away in its entirety. And again, if the keyhole approach doesn't allow us to do that, then we basically do it via the big cup, because that means that we would make sure we've taken the whole lump away. Uh, we are at the moment running uh, the world's first randomized control trial. So again, you know, that golden word of, you know, well, sort of evidence of um, it's a multi-center trial with us being one of the main centers, but it's run across Europe, so Ghent, uh, 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 Amsterdam, Maastricht, uh, where we are comparing the keyhole method versus the open method. Interestingly, th the actual results at the moment uh, appear to sort of suggest that there isn't much difference, but uh, the trial's got a couple of years to run, uh, and it would be quite interesting to see what the end result would be. So looking at taste, uh, now I'll miss that and I'll put that on. Reason being, uh, some of you might have had it. So taste is trans-arterial chemoembolization. It's a treatment, if any of you have had a heart angiogram, you might know that this is where we basically use one of the blood vessels running in your groin, which goes up towards your heart, but also supplies the blood towards the liver. We put little tubes, wires, up in, you know, so via the groin, and we can actually put dye into the blood supply in the liver. And it shows up the tumors quite nicely. You can see, the reason being that tumors in the liver, just like tumors everywhere else, have a very rich blood supply. So when you put dye into the blood supply in the liver, uh, you can actually see them light up. So tumor, tumor, big tumor, tumor, tumor. Brian Sebner is a chap who, along with his team, uh, you know, sort of does this treatment. And what he then does is he puts little beads which contain large, round, you know, sort of molecules that block the blood supply to the tumor and also deliver chemotherapy to the tumor cells at the same time. So you can selectively kill off tumor cells in the liver while hopefully preserving the normal liver. This actual treatment has quite a lot of applications in not just ocular melanoma, but we use it in pretty much every other form of cancer in the liver. And the results aren't particularly bad, but also they're not amazingly good either. But it is becoming quite obvious to us that as part of a multimodal treatment, so not just this treatment, you can actually get a good control on the disease. So, uh, and then this slide is from Brian's presentation, but the fact is that there is a subtle difference in the way the tumors light up in terms of what treatment he tends to give them. But that's taste, and there's a bit of a, uh, we've got a bit of data on, uh, uh, on taste use uh, in ocular melanoma, uh, as well as with Dabiri taste, which is the new type of taste which contains a chemotherapy agent called irinotecan. And the fact is that it does appear that uh, you can obtain uh, a median survival of about six and a half months. There are complications that come with it, but generally our patients that come in for taste will come in, have the treatment, stay in overnight, possibly stay in for 24 hours for us to keep a close eye on them, and then are home the day after. 
and essentially all they have is a cut in the groin to show for it. Generally, we will, all, you know, we will also tell our patients that they'll get flu-like symptoms. Occasionally, they will end up with things like it, uh, small abscesses in the liver where the tumors have died because the tumor essentially dies off and then normally gets absorbed by the liver itself, but occasionally will become an abscess. And occasionally, the bile ducts within the liver can get affected. So we do talk to our patients about those particular risks, but in general, these patients are home pretty quickly. Um, and again, so just a little bit in terms of fortimastine, but we don't particularly use that. Uh, and then chemotherapy, which I, uh, and then Delcath, which I suspect some of you are very keen to hear about. So currently, Southampton is the only center that is offering the Delcath treatment, which is PHP, percutaneous hepatic perfusion. Uh, the thinking behind this is that since ocular melanoma is a, a liver predominant disease, and if you have disease only in the liver, and you have done tests to show that, and by that I mean uh, you've done scans that do not show any evidence of disease elsewhere, uh, and uh, what we also do is, is a procedure called a staging laparoscopy. So before the operation, you come in for a day where I, uh, you know, sort of under GA, uh, uh, will put you to sleep and then put a camera into your tummy and inspect the liver and the other, you know, sort of organs under direct vision. Reason being that if we think that you've got extra hepatic disease, then we don't think that this treatment, which is high risk, there's no doubt about it, would be the sort of appropriate treatment to give. But if you don't have extra hepatic disease, and, and we have tr basically treated about 52 patients, well, 52 treatments now, uh, we think that there may be some future in this particular uh, type of treatment. And briefly what it does, you basically cut off. So, so the liver has a very good blood supply. It has an artery that goes into it, and it has a vein, a very large vein that goes into it. And then it has blood that comes out, well, that comes out of it and goes almost directly straight into the heart. So, um, so that's the blood going out of the liver, and the heart is literally just sitting right up there. Uh, that's the blood going into it, and there is also a large vein that supplies blood into it. So briefly, and in simplistic terms, what we do is we cut off the blood supply going into the liver, we cut off the blood supply or the blood going out of the liver, and we bathe the liver in a chemotherapy drug called melphalan for about an hour and a bit. The actual physiological changes that occur when we do that are fairly dramatic. And one of the reasons why this particular treatment hasn't taken off, well, sort of across the world and has been uh, essentially red flagged by the FDA in the States is that in the wrong hands, uh, they have had uh, a number of patient deaths. And hence, the safety of the treatment has been, has been questioned. We've done about 50-something treatments in Southampton now. It's the biggest series in the world. We only do them on ocular melanoma at the moment. Uh, and we haven't had a single death yet. And it's a combination of, uh, of Brian's expertise and also the anesthetic cover. We have essentially just two anesthetists who do the actual anesthetics. That, in fact, we think may well be the key factor here in keeping our patients well. Uh, we started off when we gave this treatment, we had patients who stayed on the intensive care for three or four days. We're now uh, getting them out of intensive care within one night, and they're home within uh, the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, very quickly, to show you what we do, uh, so, uh, and then of course, I forgot to mention the last bit, we suck the chemotherapy drug out before we restore the circulation back. Problem being that if the, if the drug, which has an extremely high concentration, leaches out into your regular circulation, you become extremely unwell. And unwell with the fact that your blood counts go down, your bone marrow gets suppressed, uh, and you have very dire consequences. We haven't had any of that happen to us, uh, and uh, uh, we, we would hope that we would continue in that vein. So the way we do it, you blow up a balloon, that's sort of, that is just below the heart there, that's just above the kidneys. That's the dye in the bit which is in contact with the liver. Uh, and uh, you have to make sure that your seals are uh, absolutely uh, rock solid. Uh, and then we bathe the liver in the chemotherapeutic drug and then filter it out. Uh, this is a slide that I generally show to sort of the, uh, well, the medical teams really, because the fact is we essentially cut off all the blood coming back into your heart from the lower body. So the heart gets 
pretty upset by that. And, but the fact is, we can actually now, with the expertise that, uh, you know, that Dr. Gupta has, uh, you know, keep things going in a, very, in a very controlled manner for quite a long time. Uh, there have been some, some studies by the company itself. Uh, I have to say uh, I was not involved in them and uh, we think that, uh, that this data is not as clean as we would like it to be. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the fact is it, there was also, unfortunately, they, uh, they compared best, best available treatment to, uh, to you know, uh, the actual treatment, Delcath, but they also crossed patients over towards the end of the study. We think that, unfortunately, uh, the survival benefit that the study showed is hampered by that crossover design. But the fact is, if you look at the actual survival curves, uh, blue uh, is the PHP, so the, you know, the actual Delcath treatment, that's best available care. Uh, if you're upwards on the curve, that's much better for you. Me you know, and median survival there is uh, eight months. Uh, uh, while not so good if you didn't have the treatment. Again, uh, you know, I would say to you that you should uh, interpret this data with caution. And overall survival, again, uh, uh, you know, the PHP, uh, including the crossover, which again, in my mind, is the thing that I would be concerned about, but does appear to show a survival benefit. Uh, we are in the process of publishing our data. Uh, this is uh, the first tranche of data that we are hoping to, to uh, essentially present in a few months' time. Uh, this was for the first 20 patients, two patients we could not give the treatment to because of anatomical variations in the brain couldn't actually get in there to give the treatment. Uh, so, uh, but the, these were the first 20 patients that we, get, uh, that we tried. Uh, 10 patients are still alive with a median of 256 days. Uh, one patient we think had complete response, four had a partial response, and 11 had stable disease after 90 days and 46% of those patients were alive after one year. I have to add, there's no randomized control trial data here. So, so the gold standard of what we say, does this work, does this not work, doesn't apply here. We're simply giving you a descriptive statistic of what we are seeing. And you know, it's a very good argument to make that if you hadn't given these patients any of these treatments, they might still be in exactly the same place where they are at the moment. So it's just something that needs to be thought, thought about. Uh, here's just a quick, quick summary uh, uh, about the actual mortality. Uh, that was the reason why the FDA thought that, uh, you know, that the treatment uh, should not get 100% approved. Uh, also, uh, the hepatic progression-free survival did not appear to show any overall survival you know, sort of benefit. And again, our feeling is in the wrong hands, uh, if you're not adequately trained, if you don't have the, you know, have the correct backup, there is a serious danger that your patients can come to harm. And that's probably one of the reasons why uh, we're at the moment the only center doing it. Liverpool are hoping to start up very quickly. Uh, I do know that there are some private hospitals in, in London that say that they will offer it. Uh, we're not entirely sure about the expertise there. Um, uh, just to show that you can have Delcath and multiple metastases uh, in the liver and still run a half marathon. Uh, very briefly on Certex. Now this is again, you know, this is sort of, it's the gadgets really. So just like sort of embolization that you can deliver small beads that contain chemotherapy into tumors in the liver, Certex is selective internal radiotherapy. So the beads actually contain radioactive particles and can be delivered into the tumors in the liver. So they're giving localized radiation treatment within the liver without harm to the patient and without harm to those around them. You know, you're not glowing in the dark. And again, does this treatment work in ocular melanoma? Well, we think it has potential. We don't have any data because of the rarity of the condition and the small, and the small patient numbers. But we do, in selected patients, offer this in Southampton. Um, so my last thing that I'm, you know, that I'm gonna say is that the multimodal approach, we think it works. Whether it improves survival is yet to be seen. Uh, our general approach, so in Southampton, we are uh, surgically led in terms of aggression. And I'm very pleased to say that Chris Nottensmeyer shares that belief. Uh, 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 so the fact is that if we think we can safely take away the disease, and by that I mean we can actually resect ocular melanoma, metastases, or extrahepatic disease, we in most instances, if we think it's safe, we will do it. 
mainly because the cytoreductive approach, we think, possibly has benefits. And by that I mean, if your tumor burden is decreased, then there is a possibility that systemic treatments may have a better chance of working on the less tumor burden that you have. Hence, we adopt a fairly aggressive approach in terms of surgery. Uh, there's no doubt that there is a nihilistic you know, sort of outlook in terms of disease in the liver in itself. And I'm not here to say to you that I'm going to cure it, but I'm here to say to you that there is possibly a light at the end of that tunnel. Uh, and then combinations of treatment. So we've had someone who's had Delcat three times. She then had right-sided liver dominant disease. So I did a laparoscopic, so keyhole right hepatectomy on her. She was then stable, or we would say, you know, uh, well, active disease free for about six to eight months. She then had disease elsewhere in the liver. We then are now giving her more Delcat. So, you know, and it may be that she has taste in the future and she may well have, you know, Certex. So the fact is the combinations are essentially endless. Oh, yes, and she's been on ipilimumab sort of across the time then. Uh, so the fact is there are combinations that we can use. Whether it makes a long-term difference, we don't know yet. But I've got an example for you. <laughs> she's in the crowd. Um, uh, I I think pretty much everybody who's worked with Neil in the last four to five years might have operated on Leslie. Uh, 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 I think that might be true. And uh, you know, you might have heard her in the media, but the fact is, she was given a diagnosis. Uh, and you know, I, I, I completely raise my hand up and say, she's one patient. This is anecdotal data, if you look at it in a scientific manner. But the fact is, she had been essentially told that there really wasn't very much that could be done for her. Six. Six and a half years ago now, is that right? And she's still here at this meeting. So, uh, so at the end of all this, that is sort of one of the things to look at. Yes, definitely we need to look at the scientific evidence, there's no doubt about it. But also we probably need to look at the disease in a slightly more positive manner. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Should we do Rob first this time around? <laughs> Thanks very much, Arjun. Um, I may have missed it, in which case I apologise, but I don't uh, think you talked much about CERT, although you just have mentioned it a yes. couple of times. So would you just outline where that fits in and what that is? Thanks. Yep. So um, I've got, so in fact, um, I think I've got a last couple of slides which have CERT in it. So CERT is a, is a treatment that uh, we've, um, uh, we've started uh, you know, sort of offering in Southampton about two, three years ago. The, uh, uh, so this is Brian you know, you know, Stedman who is doing it along with another uh, 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 you know, colleague. Uh, the fact is CERT has, uh, you might be aware, uh, been, uh, uh, been approved for second or third line you know, treatment in other liver uh, uh, cancers, essentially cholangiocarcinoma, which is a cancer of the bile ducts, as well as colorectal cancer metastases, which have been refractory to chemotherapy. Uh, reason being, it is an expensive treatment. It costs about 30, 35,000 to actually give it. Uh, but the principles are pretty much the same. So if you've got a tumor burden with high tumor turnover, uh, the fact that you can actually uh, give in or uh, have delivered radioactive particles that go and sit within the tumor and give you uh, radiotherapy sort of effectively for a few months, uh, it, we think has some benefit. The fact with CERT, and, and I have to, you know, have to mention this, is that at this point in time, we don't particularly know how to look at the effects of CERT, because CERT isn't quite like TACE, where tumors light up when they're not treated, and after you give them the taste treatment, the tumors don't light up. And by that, I mean they don't take up the dye from the blood vessels, because there is no blood going you know, you know, in there. With CERT, uh, we find it very difficult to tell you whether you've had a response or not. Uh, uh, and we think you have, and we think if you're still there and we can't see what we call is you know, sort of overt disease progression, that there probably is something going on. And I suspect that what we look at is you know, sort of overall survival. 
But at this point in time, it's too early to say to you that, you know, especially we scan people after three months or four months or six weeks, it's very hard to sort of interpret the scans to say to you that this treatment is working or not. We use CERT in, or, or have used CERT in neuroendocrine disease, where again, uh, you, know, you know, our patients have very bulky METs in the liver. Uh, the fact is, uh, we have again a small group of anecdotal patients who have done extremely well. They have no disease that we can measure even two or three years post-treatment. Uh, you know, sort of interestingly, again, with everything in the NHS at the moment, uh, it's been taken away in terms of its funding for that particular, you know, uh, well, application really, as it were. So, so, but we do think possibly it has a role to play even in ocular melanoma. Christian. So uh, the first question. So uh, the first part is very easy to answer, Kristen. As you know, uh, I, I would just like to chop it out. <laughs> uh, so, so that's the first bit. But so once that's done, uh, looking at our experience, you know, sort of experience, uh, I was a bit like you. I was fairly skeptical about Delcath, uh, 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 and uh, you know, bearing in mind we don't have we don't have randomised control trial data we are seeing some of our patients who are alive who some of them we think really have no business being alive but it is very hard to say that to you in the context of having the proper data the you know the patient subset is very small the treatment numbers that we're doing is very small what we are seeing and i think you might have mentioned this earlier christian is that with delcath we're actually seeing you know the sort of manifestations of melanoma that we've not really seen before and by that I mean, you know, I'm now, I have taken out uh, uh, lumps out of people's skin, uh, you know, because uh, uh, again, by all accounts, these patients shouldn't be here six, eight months down the line, but they are 10, 12, 15 months down the line, and, that, and their actual disease is manifesting itself in other forms. So we're seeing things like spinal metastases, skin metastases, again, very unusual in this disease. And again, if you said to me, if I had a choice and I knew it was completely safe, Delcath would be the thing that I have the best feeling about, but again, you know, I have to essentially paraphrase that with uh, the fact that we don't really have any data to support that. Running a little late for time, just one quick question, let's say. Okay, thank you.